Recording started. Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, once again, you are welcome to another session of Organic Chemistry. Okay, uh, in today's session, of course, we are going to continue with Chapter 15. Uh, we shall finish Chapter 15 today. I do some problems from Chapter 15, and then we are going to start with Chapter 16. Uh, I did post the uh, the PowerPoint uh, material for Chapter 16 in Blackboard today. I hope some of you got a chance to take a look at it. Okay, I also want to let you know that I graded your quiz, the quiz you took on Tuesday, and uh, you should stop me before, about five minutes before the end of class today, so I can give it back to you. Uh, that is one way I get a chance to, to know your names, uh, by calling you to pick up your quizzes. Okay, uh, when we left on, uh, on Tuesday, we were discussing aromaticity and aromatic compounds. <coughs> At that point, uh, we outlined some of the uh, features of an aromatic compound in which we say that for a molecule to be aromatic, it has to be cyclic. All the atoms in the rings are sp2 hybridized, and the ring must be planar. In other words, it's a flat. Uh, the ring system is flat, and also very importantly, that we, you must have uh, four m plus two pi electrons uh, within the ring system, and that particular aspect of aromat uh, aromatic compounds we refer to as the Occult rule. Occult's proof says that for a molecule to be aromatic, provided that we meet all of the other requirements, uh, it must have for M plus two pi electrons. In the case of benzene, of course, benzene has six pi electrons. So for M plus two here equals to six, which means that uh, uh, N equals to N equals to, uh, I believe we say one, right? Okay, N equals to one, so that means uh, benzene is aromatic. Uh, according to Occult's rule, in order for the molecule to be aromatic, N must be either zero or any integer. Okay, <coughs> we also gave you a simple definition of aromaticity. Uh, can somebody read this for me? Uh, Emma, can you read that for me? Uh, aromaticity is the tendency of a cyclic and planar molecule or the cyclic and planar part of the molecule that exhibits four and plus two pi electrons to exhibit the unusual stability of each residence. Very good. Now that was one very unique feature of aromatic molecules is that they are unusually stable uh, due to resonance. Resonance means that we are able to delocalize at the pi electron within the ring system. Uh, for example, we say that benzene is an hybrid of two resonance structures, this and this, okay? <coughs> now we give you uh, other examples of aromatic molecules. Uh, this molecule here, this is a naphthalene. If you take a look at this molecule here, uh, the molecule is aromatic. Uh, because it does meet all of those requirements that we gave you earlier uh, with regard to uh, the requirement for aromaticity. And of course you see here you have a total of how many pi electrons? One, two, three, four, 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So you have uh, 10 pi electrons, and if you figure this out, uh, 4m plus uh, uh, 2 equals to 10. So in this case, uh, n will be. So n will be, in this case, will be 4. Is that right? No. N, n, will be two. n will be 2. So that means that molecule is aromatic. So you could apply the same, <coughs> the same concept to most all of these molecules here uh, to determine whether they are aromatic or not. Because very often, uh, you will be given a molecule and you will have to determine whether that molecule is aromatic or not. Now, if you take a look at this here, you could also do the same thing with this molecule, antifin. So I'm going to leave that for you to, to determine. But it is aromatic. Now, we also have some aromatic molecules that are, uh, that are also ions. And they are aromatic because they also do meet all of those requirements we gave you earlier. For example, this molecule here, called cyclo cyclopentadienyl uh, lithium. If you take a look at this molecule, you have a non-bonding pair of electrons here. Uh, for this non-bonding pair of electrons, if you consider this as uh, a pair of uh, pi electrons, in this case, you have these, those two electrons residing in the p orbital. And uh, as you know, uh, the essential feature of uh, aromatic molecules uh, essentially is that they must be conjugated. Uh, for them to be conjugated, you must have a series of p orbitals here, for example, here. This will be p orbitals here. And of course, in this particular instance, this will contain one electron each, one electron each, one electron each, and all of these could overlap, okay? They could overlap in this direction here, 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 and here. Okay, so this molecule is also aromatic. Now, how many pi electrons do, does it add this molecule have? How many? Six, exactly. It has six pi electrons. So therefore, uh, n will be what? N will be what? One. Okay. Of course, it must meet all of the other requirements. Exactly. Okay. The same thing applies to this molecule here. Cyclopentyl trilinium uh, bromide. In this particular instance, if you take a, a close look at this, you see here there is a vacant orbital here because we have a formal charge of plus one on that carbon. What that means is this: the p orbital here has no electron on it. Okay, the p orbital has no electron. However, since all of these here have electrons. These are, have electrons. You could draw resonance that involve these vacant p orbitals by the overlap of this this electron here with this vacant p orbital. So. The essential feature here is that this, this carbon here has a p orbital. It is an sp2 hybridized carbon. That means the ring system is flat, and also that all of the electrons could be delocalized uh, involving all of the carbon atoms in the molecule. So we say this molecule is also aromatic. In this particular instance, how many pi electrons does it have? How many pi electrons? Six. six. That's six pi electrons. So in this case, n will also be what? n is what? One. Okay, very good. Now, let's give you some other examples of aromatic molecules. Here, this molecule we call uh, pyridine. In this particular molecule here, <coughs> let me see if I could, let me draw this molecule for you without the double bonds. Of course, each one of these carbon has a hydrogen attached to it.
Okay, we also have this pair of non-bonded electron here. Now, in this particular instance, this pair of non-bonded electron uh, is in an sp2 hybridized orbital. Okay, you have sp2 uh, hybridized orbital of nitrogen here joining with an sp2 hybridized orbital of this carbon. The same thing happens here. This this bond here uh, is due to sp2 hybridized orbital from nitrogen. Uh, joining with uh, the sp2 hybridized orbital of carbon, so you have a sigma bond. So the same thing happens in all of this here. Now, what then happens <coughs> is that you have in this here. You now, since this is the nitrogen is an sp2 hybridized atom, you now have a p orbital. Okay, the same P or another P orbital here, P orbital here, so you have those P orbitals, now each one of those P orbitals contains one electron each, Okay. Each one of those P of it contains one electron is. Now, if you take a look at this, now you could now have overlap. You could have overlap here. Okay, that those two P of it will overlap to form to form this here. And this two P of it will overlap to form this here. These two p orbitals will overlap to form this here. Okay, so now you have the double bond. Now we could also draw another resonance contribution, and what would that be? To draw another resonance contribution, move the double bond exactly. Is that at the here? Okay, very good. Okay, so another way we could overlap this would be this here. Let's take this. Double bond out, take this out. Okay, if we also overlap here, overlap there, those two could overlap, and these two could overlap, and these two could overlap. I'm sorry, this here. So if you do that, what are we going to get? We get a different resonance structure in which this molecule now looks like this. Okay, so the double bond is here. We say this is the two electron in the sp2 hybridizer orbital. Now we have this double bond is here. Now we have the double bond is here. So these two are resonance structures as a result of different overlap of the p orbitals. Now in this particular instance, how many electrons does the nitrogen contribute uh, to the uh, <coughs> Uh, to the aromatic system, to the pi electron system. How many electrons? I mean, if you look at this here, how many electrons does it contribute? One, exactly. It only contributes one electron. Okay? Okay. Say that again. No. Oh, can I repeat? Okay, very good. Okay, now the question I ask is how many electrons does, ni does nitrogen contribute to this uh, aromatic, uh, the pi electron system in, within the aromatic ring system? How many electrons does nitrogen contribute? That was the question, and the answer was one, because of you only have one electron here, okay? Okay, this is another example here, this molecule here. This molecule here we call ta uh, taufin uh, is another example of an aromatic uh, ring system. Here uh, we consider this pair of electrons here, this electron here, as a pi electron. So therefore what we are saying here is that this here, this electron here will be 
two electrons in the uh, uh, sp2 abidized orbital. This is an sp2 abidized orbital here. Another sp2 abidized orbital here. Therefore, these two electrons here will belong to a p orbital. If you mind the p orbital, in order for them to overlap, they must they must be perpendicular to the ring system for them to overlap. In the case of the uh, sp2 hybridized orbital here, it's almost as if it is here, it's not perpendicular. If you look at the ring, say this is the ring, the sp2 orbital is here. So it cannot overlap with those orbitals that, uh, that are per perpendicular to the ring. So that is what we have there. So this will be here, p orbital here, p orbital here, p orbital here. So the overlap you're going to, you are going to have will be overlap between this p orbital. Now let me make it uh, what it looks like. Between this p orbital, between this p orbital, okay, and sometimes we could also get overlap between this and this. In other words, those electrons could simply just move around. Okay, the, P, the two uh, electrons in this uh, P orbital here could also move along this uh, aromatic, uh, the pi uh, electron system within the aromatic molecule. So we also say this molecule here is aromatic because as you can see here, it contains uh, six pi electrons. Keep in mind that we do not count this as part of the pi electron system in the ring because that is in the P sp2 hybridized orbital. Okay? So in this particular instance, our software contributes how many electrons to the pi electron system of the ring? Two, exactly. So in this case, software will contribute two uh, pi electrons to the aromatic ring system. N now we could do the same thing on this molecule. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't bring my uh, model here. Okay, these other two electrons here. That's a good question. The question that uh, uh, Melad is asking is, how come these two here do not contribute to the pi electron system? Okay, the answer to that is, this sulfur is an sp2 hybridized atom. Okay, for for sulfur to be an sp2 hybridized atom. That means you have uh, three orbitals, or three sp2 uh, abidized orbitals. And one of those p uh, abidized orbitals, sp2 abidized orbitals, will be this here. Another one will be this here. The third one is this here. So those two electrons are in the sp2 abidized orbital. Okay? Now, you now have a p orbital that is left. Okay, the p orbital that is left will be, for the lack of being able to draw this better, the p orbital will be here, okay? And that is where those, these two electrons will be in here. It is the p orbital that overlap. The sp2 abidized orbital do not overlap because if look at the, the ring system, right? You have p orbital here, p orbital here, p orbital here, perpendicular to the ring system. The overlap is between them. On the other hand, the sp2 abidized orbital will be here. They do not get a chance to overlap with the p orbital. You follow that? Okay. So that is what, yes. How can sulfur is sp2 hybridized? Well, in this particular instance, in order for it to be, uh, to be aromatic, uh, it assumes an uh, sp2 hybridization. Keep in mind, when we talk about hybridization, uh, this is not something that is completely fixed. Uh, and uh, every atom would decide to uh, undergo a particular hybridization depending on where it finds itself. So this is not something you just say, okay, it must be uh, this hybridization all the time. Sometimes when you want to perform a chemical reaction, atoms simply just assume a different uh, uh, hybridization. So in this case, it is sp2 hybridized. Okay. okay. So the same argument we could make here. Okay, so if I ask you, these two pairs of electrons here, 
where do you think this uh, pair of electron will be? Would that be in a p orbital or sp2 hybridized orbital? If we say this molecule is aromatic, where will it be? In the p orbital, because that is the only way this, these two electrons will uh, interact with the rest of the electrons in the pi electron system. Okay, it must be in the p orbital. So in this particular instance, this nitrogen is contributing two electrons to the pi electron to the uh, uh, pi electron system of the aromatic uh, system. Okay. Okay, so those are examples of aromatic molecules. Uh, in other words, what you see here is aromatic molecules does not always mean benzene. Okay? Now, why, do, why are aromatic molecules very important? Of course, they are very, most of them, most biological uh, molecules or most molecules that have biological function contain, uh, contain aromatic uh, compounds. For those of you who are going to pharmacy, you're going to find that you will, you will be doing a lot of work uh, dealing with aromatic molecules. And those of you going to graduate school in chemistry, a lot of work is actually done. Somebody smiling. That's <laughs> Why are you smiling? You don't want to go to graduate school in chemistry? You get a chance to make drugs. You know that most of you, no, seriously. Oh, no, I don't mean that kind of drug. Jessica is laughing. <laughs> Jessica is laughing, no. <laughs> no, I don't mean that kind of drug. <laughs> no, I, I, no, no, I take that back. You don't get a chance to make drugs. <laughs> you get a chance to make chemicals that can be used to, to uh, for medicinal uh, drugs, okay? <laughs> no, seriously, you will find that most of the uh, drugs that you have out there, they are not made by medical doctors, okay? These are made by chemists, you know, PhD chemists. You go and design uh, different uh, uh, molecules that could potentially act as a drug. So what the, uh, what the medical doctor simply just do, does is to simply prescribe the medicine. That's all. They are very lazy people, you know that. <laughs> you all don't like that, eh? <laughs> so anyway. Uh, it is the chemists, the pharmacists, those are the people who make the drugs, okay? And you're going to see examples of some of those uh, synthesis uh, as we progress during the course of this semester. Now, you see here, this is aspirin. Okay, you all, all of you know aspirin, right? Very simple molecule. Uh, you, before the end of, uh, by the time we get to chapter 16, you should be able to make this molecule here. Uh, of course, this is Tylenol. You see this here. Uh, so some countries, they refer to this as paracetamol, uh, mostly in Europe and Africa. Of course, you have uh, uh, tryptophan, which is an amino acid, contains aromatic ring system. It's also aromatic. Uh, okay, this molecule here is a component of your DNA and RNA. But the point to be made there, these molecules are very important biological molecules. Okay. Okay, now you see a uh, Lipitor. How many of you have heard of Lipitor before? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they, they advertise this all the time. I think there was some problem with this some time ago. Anyway, this is uh, another important uh, uh, drug that uh, that uh, that been used uh, very extensively over the last uh, few years. Uh, quinine, which is an anti-malaria agent. In all of these cases, you see the aromatic uh, ring system. Okay, so this, this ring system are really very important uh, biological uh, uh, moieties. Okay, now let us begin to take a look at the uh, nomenclature of aromatic molecules. Uh, the table that you have here, you need to know this table. You know every single molecule on this uh, table here. Because most of the time, uh, this molecule that you see on, the, in the, on this table, they will serve as your base names for most of your nomenclature. In other words, uh, benzene is a base name, uh, benzoic acid is a base name, benzaldehyde is a base name, uh, toluene. So any one of these molecules could be used as a base name when it comes to uh, nomenclature. And of course, <coughs> The rule of nomenclature very often is the same set of rules that we have been accustomed to 
uh, uh, when we did uh, organic one. In this particular system here, this molecule here we call bromobenzene, simply meaning that uh, this, this is a derivative of benzene, and of course this is nitro group attached to benzene, so we call this nitro benzene. Here you have the uh, propyl group attached to benzene, simply call this uh, propyl benzene. Now in the case in which you have several substituents on the ring system, if you have several, yes, yeah, Sinead White, say that again. Oh, the N, okay, very good. Uh, Sinead is asking what does this N stand for? N stands for what we say normal if you have Normal simply means that it is a, uh, when you have an arcane, that is, there is no branching on the arcane, you say that's a normal arcane, in other words, no branch. Okay? Okay, for example, if I have this, okay, so I will call this N butane. In other words, there is no branching in the butane molecule, it's simply a straight chain molecule. As opposed to if you have this here, okay, that is a branch uh, butane, so therefore this is N butane and this is branch, so the N stands for normal. Okay, so this simply means that it is a uh, an n propyl benzene, meaning that it is a uh, three carbon atoms joined together uh, in, this, uh, in, a, in a linear fashion. Okay, now if you have a molecule that has uh, several uh, substituents, okay, does anybody know what the name of this is? <laughs> does anybody know what the name of this is? Yeah, Melissa, do you know what the name of this is? Okay, that's a four bromo. Continue. <laughs> okay, continue now, continue. Okay, very good. See, you see how easy that is? Okay. <laughs> Okay, now in this case, what do you what do you do? Uh, the same rule of nomenclature that we used to uh, use in uh, the previous chapter, we are going to use here. You assign a no, you assign number to the carbon atoms that contain the uh, the substituent, the lowest combination of numbers. That is what you do. You assign the lowest combination of numbers to all of the carbons containing the, uh, the branches. Okay, so in this case, we call this carbon number one, so the one, two, three, four, okay, so the, this is, uh, therefore, becomes 4-bromo-1-2 dimethylbenzene. Why do we uh, call this 4-bromo-1-2? Why the bromo first? Anybody has an idea? Alphabetical order, e excellent, very good. In other words, once you assign the numbers, then to give the name, you got to give the name based on alphabet, uh, alphabetizing order. Okay, very good. Yes, you may go ahead. No, because you have to go by alphabet. B comes before uh, uh, M. Uh, which one? We call the uh, Bromo one. Call the Bromo one. Okay, let's try that. If this is wrong, but let us try it just to see. <laughs> okay, let us say this is position number one, right? Follow me now, right? So this is two, right? This is three, and this is four. So that would be one, three, four. One plus three plus four, and what is that? Eight, right? Okay, as opposed to one plus two, that is three plus four. That is seven. 
keep in mind I told you you need to assign the numbers so that you get the lowest combination of numbers. Will you follow that? Okay, very good. Okay, now another molecule here. In this case, uh, this we call this a phenol. The base name is a phenol. If you recall, uh, in the last slide, uh, this is phenol. Uh, this molecule here is phenol. Anytime you have an hydroxy group attached to the benzene molecule, we call that a phenol. So this could be a base name, okay? So therefore, so here, therefore you call this a phenol, and then uh, the the uh, the carbon uh, to which the oxygen is attached to, in this case, will be carbon number one. And then from there, you assign number to the rest of the molecule so that you get the lowest combination of numbers. Okay? Yes. Um, there's one carbon that was not a... Uh, um, Toluene. Very good. It could be taller. You could do it that way. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if, but if you do it that way, this, okay, of course, this is figuring the carbon number one, right? And then so you say, well, uh, two, two met I mean, four bromo, two methyl toluene. So yeah. right? yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You could use toluene could be a base name. Okay, so here, uh, here you have two five dimethyl phenol because phenol is the base name. Keep in mind you assign the, uh, the numbers uh, so that you get the lowest combination of numbers. Here. Uh, what is the name of this? How do we call this? Eric, what is the name of this? Okay, 246-trinitotolerine. You see, Eric is already ahead of everybody. He knows, he knows the name already. Okay, so 246-trinitotolerine. Okay, because just, you know, the question you just asked. So the base name here is uh, toluene. And therefore, you simply uh, say that carbon to which the metal is attached is carbon number one, and then you, ass you assign number to the rest of the molecule to get the lowest combination of numbers. Okay. Now, there are certain instances when you use uh, what we call uh, the, uh, the alternative uh, nomenclature. In this case, if you have if you have this molecule here, okay, say you have a phenol right here. Just as we just pointed out to you here, this position here, the two positions we refer to as the auto position. Okay, auto position. And very often we abbreviate uh, auto as O. Now, so that would be number two position. Now, the number three position we refer to as meta position. Okay, so this is your meta position. And we abbreviate that when we give the name as M. And finally, this position here, the number four position, what do we call this? That para position, exactly. We call it para position. And we have the abbreviation P. Okay, so if we do that, we could use that designate the designation auto meta para to name a molecule provided you only have no more than two uh, substituents on the benzene ring. This only applies when you have only two substituents on the benzene ring. You do not use the met, uh, auto para, meta para when you have more than two. Yes, there, right. No, you do not say one or two or whatever, yes. So the question there is asking uh, when you use the auto uh, meta para, do you see use one, two, three? No, you don't use the numbers. 
Okay, so, okay, for example, in this particular instance here, you have this, this molecule here, we call this a uh, metal dimethyl benzene or M dimethyl benzene. In other words, the two methyl groups are metal to each other. They are in a one three relationship to each other. You see that? Okay, so that would be an acceptable name for this molecule here. Now, here, what do we call this? Okay, we, the base name is toluene. So we simply call this P bromo toluene. In other words, the, bro, the bromine atom is in the fourth position relative to the methyl group of the toluene. Okay, so you could uh, say that P bromo toluene. And another example here. Keep in mind that this molecule here, this part of this molecule here, this is also an accepted base name. If you go back to the table that we showed you earlier, a benzaldehyde, that is this molecule here. That is also an accepted uh, base name. Okay? So what we have here, so this becomes P chloro, it will either say parachloro benzaldehyde or P chloro benzaldehyde. Okay? So those are the different ways in which you name you could name uh these aromatic molecules here. Brea, go ahead. Okay, let's see. What if they are different? Okay, let's like Okay, let me draw this. Okay. The question Bea is asking, what if the substituents are different? Okay, say we say uh, bromine and uh, nitro, right? Is that what you mean? Okay, so how will you name this? Then in this case you will name this uh, as you could name this as a as a benzene. Uh, you could name this as benzene, or you could even name it as bromobenzene. In this case, I would say <coughs> M nitro bromo benzene. You could do that, or you could uh, just say. One bromo one bromo three nitro benzene. You could do that. Okay. Okay. Which one? Can you say M uh, M bromo nitro uh, benzene? Yes, you could do that too. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now let us go back to where we are. Okay. That's already. Okay. I think we okay very good. Okay, so at this point, yes. Mm -hmm. this, this one here? Okay, how do we know it's meta? Because they are one three relationship to each other. The meta are always one three relationship to each other. Position one, position two, position three. Okay, very good. Okay, now let's do, before we leave chapter 15, let's do a few problems. Yes, David. Say that again. Where, no, I can't hear you. Where is the number? Oh, for what, what other number to use for the auto? Yeah. Oh no, I feel I don't I don't follow that. Oh, oh, it's one and two. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, thanks. 
Well, the, the author is a one-two relationship to each other. And the para will be one-four relationship to each other. Okay, you follow that? Okay, very good. Okay, let, now let, before we leave chapter 15, let us do a few problems. Okay. Okay, uh, David, go ahead and read uh, this question first. Okay, give the IU pack names for the following compounds. Okay, now let us try this B for. Let us try B first. What would be the name for B? I will tell you the base name is benzoic acid. Okay, what is it? Okay, you could read us, you know, where the position? 3 bromo, exactly. So this could be 3 bromo benzoic acid. Now, what would be your alternative name for that? M bromo, you could also say M bromo benzoic acid. Okay. How about this uh, C? Let us try C. What would be the name for C? C. Uh, okay. What would be the base name that you want to use? You want to use toluene? Okay. You want to use toluene as the base name? Okay. Therefore, this would be carbon 1, right? 2 and 3, okay? Or you could also use a benzene as a base name. Okay, so in that case, what would be the name? What would be the name? Uh, what is it? No, this is position number one. I'm sorry. Position number one, number two, three, four, five. Thank you. And six. Okay. So that becomes five bromo. One, five bromo, three, oh, that you want to name it as a benzene derivative? As a benzene base name, right? Okay, if you do that, okay. Okay, I thought you wanted to name it as a toluene. Okay, let's. If you want to name it as uh, benzene, so that becomes 5 bromo, and then it becomes 1, okay, 1, 3, right? One three dimethyl benzene. So in other words, we are naming this as a benzene derivative. Yes. Why why with bromine? Why bromo first? Why why do I start with bromo first? Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Why didn't I start with uh, bromine? That's, that's a good one. Actually, I should have done that because of the alphabet action order, yes. So we need to expand the Right, let's see. Because of the alphabet. Now, this is another, okay, very good. Whenever the, uh, the nomenclature is going to be the same, I'm sorry, whenever the numbering will be the same regardless of where you start, then you have to take account of the alphabet type in order. Okay, in this case, uh, any one of them could be 1, 2, and 3. But because bromine here takes priority over the methyl, so this has to be 1, and then this becomes 2, uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So therefore, let us rename this. That was a, a good observation on your part. What's your name? 
Pacific. Okay, very good. So that becomes one bromo, one bromo, three five dimethyl benzene. Okay. Okay, let us name this. Let us name that. Uh, I will tell you now the this group here, the amino group attached to benzene, uh, is a base name, and the base name is aniline. Okay, whenever you see the um, this group here, nitrogen attached to two hydrogens, we refer to as an amino group. Whenever it is attached to benzene, then we call this aniline. It's one of those uh, base names that we gave you earlier. Okay, so what would be the name for this? Yes. Okay, if we're going to name this as aniline, the carbon to which the nitrogen is attached to must be carbon number one. Okay, so that becomes four, exactly. So it could, this would become four, four chloroaniline. Okay, or you could, alternatively, you could do, say what? P chloroaniline or P chloro. Aniline. Okay. Now, there are certain instances. Now we want to deal with uh, A. Let us name A. There are certain instances in which you use the uh, the benzene ring as a as a substituent, as a branch. If, for example, as in this as in this case, you have the benzene ring is attached to a carbon skeleton that has six carbon or more. In other words, uh, more more carbon than what you have in the benzene ring. Then you have to use you could use the benzene ring as a substituent. In that case, this group here becomes what we call a phenyl group. Okay, it becomes phenyl. Okay? So in that case, if we are going to name this as a branch or as a substituent, then the, the, uh, the, the base name will have to be the, car the longest carbon chain in the, uh, in the, in the carbon, uh, the, yeah, the longest carbon chain uh, in the uh, parent molecule, which is this one here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the longest carbon chain is six. So you're going to have to name this as a derivative of hexane. Okay. So in that case, in that case, if you look at this here. Okay, Patrick. Okay, just the question. The question you brought up earlier. In this particular instance. If we name this as a derivative of xn, we could start the number from here, right? We could also start the number from here, okay? In either case, the, the substituent, in this case the methyl or the phenyl, will be in position number two, right? So where do you think we should start? And what would determine where we start? Yes. Is that uh, uh, Karis? Jasmine, I'm sorry. Yes. So where, where, okay, why do you start where the phenyl is? Why? Well, the answer lies with what that practice you had told us earlier. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Exactly. At that point, you have to use as a beta in order. Anytime you have a molecule, in which your numbering could be, uh, you could use any numbering, and you're going to arrive at the same uh, number system. Then you then have to fall back to alphabetizing uh, priority. Okay. So in this case, since M comes before a P, so therefore this becomes carbon number one, carbon number two, three, four, five, and six. 
So this becomes the name of this compound, therefore, will be what? 2 methyl. Five, okay, five phenyl. Okay, excellent, exactly. Okay, and that is how you do that. Okay, let's do one more problem before we leave chapter 15. Let's see, how much time do we have left? 702, oh, very good. Okay, let's do a couple of these problems here. Okay, let's see who have I, I need to, somebody there that I've not talked to you. I don't know most of your name. Sean, go ahead and read this question for us. <laughs> okay, draw structures corresponding to the following names. What is the first one? Okay, in this case, they, they, in this case, they do want us to give the structure of three methyl one two benzene diamine. Okay, I will tell you. <coughs> in this particular instance, this here, when they say diamine, they mean that you have two of these, two of these groups attached to benzene. Okay, so what would be the structure for number one for A? We do the uh, we do benzene right? Got the benzene right? Okay, and we say one two diamine. So that means the two amino group. We refer to this as amino. We refer to this as amino group. So the two amino groups are in a one-two relationship to each other, right? Is that what you say? Very good. Okay, so, so where is the metal? Okay, so if this is position number one, right? Position number two, therefore metal is here. Very good. Okay, uh, somebody want to try uh, B? Yes, yeah, Jessica, go ahead. Okay, so benzene. <laughs> three alcohols. Okay. Okay, is this in alcohol? Three hydroxy group. <laughs> three hydroxy group. Okay, it's one, three, five, benzene, try all, right? Very good. So you have three hydroxy group. Now, the reason why I say it is in alcohol, whenever you have an OH attached to benzene, we call it a phenol. Okay, OH attached to benzene is a phenol. Okay, for you to have an alcohol, you must have what? Oh, is it 135? Oh, I'm sorry. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Okay, one, three, five benzene trials. Now, oh, what? I think uh, I need to change my glasses. One, three, five. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, very good. <coughs> okay, so that's one, three, five benzene trial. Is that okay? Okay, very good. So now, what I was trying to say is, when you say an alcohol, an alcohol is an, o, an hydroxy group attached to an sp3 carbon. Okay. Okay. Now, about uh, let's do C. Anybody want to try C? This is B. Anybody want to try C? Ambria, you want to help me out? Sure. Okay. <laughs> you have been drafted, right? <laughs> okay. What's your name? What's your name? 
Okay. So the base name is what? Exchange. Exchange. Very good. Okay, so we have two fennel. Let's put this here. Two fennel and three metal. And then exchange, right? Okay. Okay, so that is C. Okay, anybody want to try uh, D? Okay, David. Three. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, no. He said three metal. Two fennel, the fennel group, this is the fennel group. Oh, no, no, you, you, you cannot. Okay, because the base name is Etienne. Okay, the base name is, you, uh, you, you are naming this as if these are as, uh, derivatives of Etienne. Okay, so what we are saying here, the, uh, the metal group is, is on the three carbon of Etienne, and the fennel group is on the two carbon of Etienne. Okay. Okay, so let us do uh that did I say D? Okay. Okay, so David you want to try D for us? Okay. Benzoic acid, what's the name? What is the name? Okay, that is O amino benzoic acid. Okay, so what do we do? Benzoic acid. That's your benzoic acid. It's a base name, and then you say O oh, amino, right? So the amino group is on the two position. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So I will leave the rest to you. You should be able to do this. Uh, uh, e, uh, uh, e and F. That is simple. Okay, at this point, we finish chapter uh, 15. So now we are going to start chapter 16. Okay. Now, chapter 16 is essentially a continuation of chapter 15. Uh, if you notice, in chapter 15, we dealt with aromaticity. We know what our aromatic molecules look like. And then we also gave you the uh, examples of aromatic compounds and then the nomenclature of aromatic compounds. Now with chapter 16, now we're going to now begin to look at the reactions of aromatic compounds. So for the most part, we will be looking at what we call electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, you will find that because of the unusual stability of the aromatic compounds, they do not undergo the same type of reactions that we see with a conjugate, regular conjugated system, uh, reaction uh, that we see with uh, alkenes in which we have electrophilic addition. No, they do not do that. In this case, they simply undergo what we call Electroph electrophilic aromatic substitution. Now, what does that mean? Of course, we're also going to take a look at nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Most of these reactions are essentially substitution reactions that will maintain the aromaticity, uh, the aromatic nature of this uh, ring system. Okay, we're also going to take a look at the side chain reactions. And finally, we will be looking at what we call a series of synthetic uh, uh, reactions. Now, what do we mean by electrophilic aromatic substitution? Okay, of course, you know what this is, so this, use this as a study guide. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let us now begin to take a look at the series of reactions. What I want to do here, 
Uh, I will give you this series of reactions. Then when we come back on Tuesday, I will then begin to give you the mechanism of this reaction. In other words, how do this reaction take place? So the, what we're going to do today is simply show you the reagents that we need to uh, use uh, to perform some of these reactions. Now, if you look at this, these are examples of electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions now when we say substitution what do we mean by substitution and anybody tell me when when we say substitution what do we mean we are replacing exactly we are replacing remember in when we were dealing with our kings and conjugated system, we were talking about electrophilic addition. But in the case of the aromatic uh, molecules, since the aromatic molecules want to maintain the aromatic nature of those molecules, they do not undergo uh, addition reaction very easily. So what we are going to see here is a series of substitution reactions. For example, if we take benzene, we could replace this hydrogen in benzene with chlorine by using chlorine and a catalyst. In this case, the iron 3 chloride is a catalyst. Okay? So I get chlorobenzene. Okay? Of course, the HCl is a byproduct. Like I said, I will show you the mechanism of this reaction uh, when we come back on uh, Tuesday. Now, if you want to form iodobenzene, this is the reagent you use. In other words, what I want to, you to do, you must know these reagents. It is most important that you know this reagent. If you do not know this reagent, you are going to run into trouble. Yes. Well, we also know the um, catalyst, please. Yes. This is the reagent that you need. Chlorine in the presence of iron 3 chloride. Okay, Those, that is the reagent that you need in order to perform that reaction. Now. If you want to do iodination, in other words, you want to replace the hydrogen on benzene with iodine, this is the reagent you need, iodine in copper 2 chloride, okay? Now, supposing you want to form bromobenzene, what reagent do you need? Anybody knows? Bromine and iron 3 bromide. Okay, so these reagents are very important. You must know them. Okay? As to how these reactions occur, we will deal with that later. But right now, it is most important that you know what these reagents do and you know the kind of reagent that you need to perform a particular synthetic uh, operation. Okay. So uh, this series of reactions I've just given you here of course, we refer to as halogenation reactions, halogenation because we are adding halogen, we are using halogen to replace hydrogen in the benzene molecule. Okay, we could also perform what we call sulfonation, nitration, and amination, starting with benzene. If you want to substitute this hydrogen with this sulfonic, uh, sulfonic acid group, SO3H, this is the reagent you need. You need sulfur di uh, trioxide and sulfuric acid. Sulfur trioxide and sulfuric acid. You just have to know this. Now, supposing I want to form nitrobenzene, what reagent do I need to form nitrobenzene from benzene? What reagent? What is it? Nitric acid and sulfuric acid, exactly. If I want to do nitration, I need to use this reagent here. There is no other way to do, to do this. You want to replace hydrogen on benzene, with nitro group, this is the nitro group, you must use this reagent. 
Okay? Now, suppose now I want to form aniline. If I want to form aniline, okay, in this case, it, it's very difficult to form aniline directly from benzene. So what do I do? I make the nitro benzene first. Then I take the nitro benzene. I add hydrogen chloride and iron to form the aniline. Or instead of using the HCl and iron, I could also use this. I could use hydrogen. This is another reagent you could use to do that. Hydrogen and some kind of catalyst like palladium. Okay? Those two reagents will convert the nitro group to the amino group. So therefore, the net process here So if I say I want you to go from here, I say I want you to go from here to to here. So what are you going to do? I want you to perform, the, give me the synthetic scheme from benzene to aniline. Okay, what will be the reagent? Step one. Okay, nitration. You do nitration first. And to do nitration, you need nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And then you follow that up with what? Exactly. ACL and iron. Or hydrogen, um, palladium, or platinum, okay? Okay, so those are the kind of things you'll be, be thinking of. As we go along, you're going to have a series of a synthesis that might take you from A to B, in which you need about uh, 10 different steps. So that means you need to be able to know each one of those uh, reactions and reagents in order for you to do that, okay? Okay, so now we know how to do sulfonation. If I tell you sulfonation, you know what sulfonation means. Sulfonation simply means uh, you are replacing hydrogen on benzene with the sulfonic acid group. We call this sulfonic acid group. That's that's SO3H. Okay. And the reagent you use for that is sulfur trioxide and sulfuric acid. Now, supposing I want you to form toluene, I want you to make toluene, or I want you to make isopropyl benzene, okay? You use what we call Friedel Craft alkylation. The Friedel Craft alkylation in which you take the corresponding alkyl chloride or sometimes bromide and they use, use as a catalyst aluminum chloride to form that product. Say for example, supposing I want to go from here, from benzene, to toluene. <coughs> okay, how do I do that? From benzene to toluene. I will take what uh, LR do I need? I'll take methyl chloride, right? I could take methyl chloride or even sometimes methyl bromide and then use as a catalyst aluminum chloride. Okay, that will give me that. Okay, supposing I want to go from here to 
to form isopropyl benzene. I want to form isopropyl benzene. Okay, how will I do that? To go from benzene to isopropyl benzene. You have to use the corresponding alkyl halide. And what will be the corresponding alkyl halide? The question is here. How do you do that? Okay, sorry. Okay, the corresponding alkyl halide will be this. Isopropyl or two are uh, two chloro propane or isopropyl chloride followed by aluminum chloride. Okay? Now, there is one feature of this reaction. What time do we have? Okay. There is one feature of this reaction I want to leave you with before we, we leave today. And that is if you, by the way, we call this series of reactions, we refer to this as Fiddlecraft. Calculation. Now, Friedelcraft alkylation has some limitation, and that is because in Friedelcraft alkylation, if I have, say for example, I have this here, I have this, and I want to react this with benzene, I want to react with benzene, of course use aluminum chloride as a catalyst, what product do you think I will get? What product do you think I will get? Just based on what we just done. This is pre craft alkylation. What is it? Okay, and put your Benzene, right? Okay, very good. This is the product I will expect to get. I will expect to get this product. Okay, right? Is that right? But that is not the case. This is one case in which I have to give you the mechanism before we proceed. Because what happens is, whenever you do a Friedel Craft alkylation, okay, whenever you do a Friedel Craft alkylation, let us say we have an alkyl group, an alkyl halide, and you have your aluminum chloride, what happens is that in the process, the first thing you form. The aluminum chloride is a Lewis acid. And what are Lewis acid? What do they want? Lewis acid? What they're looking for electrons. So what they do attract this here. Okay. And in so doing, when it's attracting this here, in so doing, end up breaking this away. Okay breaking the carbon halogen bond. So what do we get? We end up with a carbocation plus the aluminum chloride complex. You form a carbocation. What happens when you form a carbocation? carbocation will rearrange to form the most stable carbocation. So in this particular instance, okay, in this particular instance, say we form so the first thing that is going to happen here, we form the carbocation here, which is this here,
What kind of carbocation is that? That's a primary carbocation. Now, carbocation are very reactive species, very notorious species, just as notorious as the free radicals. So what is going to happen, this will rearrange to form the most stable carbocation. There will be an, a shift, the hydride, what we call the hydride shift. This hydrogen will shift to here to form a secondary carbocation. Now it is this secondary carbocation that will react with benzene to form the final product. Now this will now react with benzene, okay? In other words, what I've done here is to give you the mechanism of this reaction in a way. So therefore, the product you are going to get will be the product that is coming from the secondary carbocation. So that is the product you are going to get, this here, not this. Because the initial process in Friedel-Crab alkylation is the formation of a carbocation. You follow that? The initial process in the uh, Friedel-Crab alkylation is the formation of a carbocation. And any reaction that goes through the formation of a carbocation, if you do not form the stable, most stable carbocation initially, that carbocation will rearrange to form the most stable carbocation. And that is what is then going to react with benzene to form the final product. Okay, so on that note, we are going to finish, uh, continue with chapter 16 on, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, but do not go, let me give you back your, let me give you back your uh, quizzes.